Hello everyone, Simon Jacobson here. Another episode of Biblical Characters Decoded. Today we will talk about Jeremiah, the prophet of doom and deliverance. And the reason for that is because today in the Hebrew calendar, this is the saddest day of the Hebrew calendar, it uh, commemorates and we recreate the destruction of the two holy temples in Jerusalem, which represented more than just buildings, but actually represents the very essence of dissonance, the dissonance between heaven and earth, between transcendence and survival, between spirit and matter, between living a life of purpose and meaning and letting it permeate the very existence of this material life that we live. That's what the temple represented, a bridge, an interface between energy and matter. In a sense, when you ask somebody, who are you? And they give you their business card, that's essentially saying what you do. It's not who you are. And sadly, some of us will say, well, what I do has become who I am. That's dissonance. That's a schism. So on this day, we remember every form of disconnect that we have in our lives, the detachments, the disappointments, the divisions that uh, splinter us into two parts or into many parts. So how appropriate is then to talk about the prophet, the prophet who wrote the book of Lamentations, which is traditionally read on this day, the book of Echa in Hebrew, Lamentations. There's, of course, the book of Jeremiah. And we have other documents from him. So Jeremiah represented a very interesting paradox, something that I think we all can learn from in our own personal lives. How to deal with darkness, how to deal with despair. I mean, none of us are immune to situations in our lives where we have to deal with some type of short, some type of shortcoming, some setback, speaking on a mild level. Or if it's more intense, some trauma, pain, loss, disappointment, death, tragedy, we should all be protected. But in life, that's the twists and turns of life are going to bring situations when things are difficult. Some people in those times don't know how to forge ahead, get paralyzed, get trapped. Many of us become bitter and angry. Many of us become numb. So looking at a man, a prophet like Jeremiah, who saw darkness, and not only that, he shared it, not with the intention of sharing something painful, but to talk to the people about the consequences of their depra depravity and their corrupt behavior must have not been easy. At the same time, he also provided us with a tremendous vision of deliverance, of redemption and salvation. And that's not an easy thing to balance the two. It's one thing when you live in the light. Okay, so you're familiar with light. It's another when you live in the darkness, you're familiar with darkness. But to straddle both of them and to be able to find light within darkness is a very complicated thing. So let's talk about this Jeremiah. So firstly, his name itself, in contrast to another great prophet, the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah and Jeremiah are often talked about as two prophets, but the, the, both their names and their prophecies were very different. They both talked about destruction, but Yeshaya, or Isaiah, spoke a lot more about the redemption where the destruction was leading to redemption. And it was Jeremiah that spoke more about the consequences of destruction, the consequences, what will happen. And when you think about it, from a psychological point of view, there's, a, a, there's a necessity to address both issues. When someone's dealing with any form of trap, let's call it an addiction, just using that as an example, it could be anything that blinds us psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. So there's one thing is looking at and saying, oh, look how far I've wandered and look how much beautiful things I'm missing in my life. In other words, f fight the darkness with looking at what it can be potentially beautiful and how much is being, is being missed. 
A person who's addicted is unable to be there for their loved ones, for their children, for family, for an example. On the other hand, there's another thing is to focus on, look at the consequences of your behavior, what we call hitting rock bottom. Which one works better? And the answer is there's no cookie cutter model. It's not one size fits all. It all depends on situation. Obviously, the best way to motivate someone is by motivating them in a positive way. Instead of saying, look how far you've fallen or how bad it can get, and it can get even worse, to motivate someone by showing the potential, showing how much you can achieve. But there are times when we have no choice, but we need to understand the consequences because when we don't, we can go into denial. I remember reading uh, uh, David Carr's book, The Night of the Smoking Gun, he became a very, uh, very powerful writer at the New York Times. But before that, uh, he lived a life that was, a, as he put it, a crack addict. He was a crackhead. And in his book, he describes a scene, which I'll just share simply because it left such an impression on me. He describes a scene where he says he and his girlfriend, they were smoking crack and they were really destroying their lives. But then they decided to get married. And um, two dysfunctional addicts, decided to get married, and they had children. I think twins or two children. I think it was either two children or twins. I don't remember right now. Anyway, okay, fine. He says it was a very irresponsible thing to do, but that's what we did. We had children. Um, and they, they, he thought, and she thought, that we could take care of our children, we love our kids, and we'll, uh, we'll deal with it. But they didn't rev- never really confronted it and never really dealt with their addiction. Well, one day, he had a craving, and, uh, but the problem was he, was he was with his two kids. And he needed to go to a crack house, as he put it. Um, and uh, so he decided he'll pack them up. It was a very cold day. Put them in the car, in blankets, and covered them up and all that, and coats and, that, and so on. And he said, you know what? I'll go to the crack house. I'll leave the car on with the heater on. And I'll go into the do my thing, and I'll come back. In his delusional mind, he thought that's a responsible thing to do. And he went to the crack house, and he thought he was going in for 15 minutes, but as things go with these things, you had lose sense of time, and he lost complete sense of time. By the time he came out, it was two hours later. And he was like in, in a stupor, slipping over himself. And then suddenly he looks at the car, and he realizes, he remembers. And he looks at the car, the car is completely smoked up. Because he left the heat on, so the heat built up. And suddenly it dawned upon him, he had two little babies in there. And he ran for his life, he said. And he opened up the back door. But he thought, who knows what could have happened. And to his surprise and shock, they were both there sleeping calmly. And he had this wake-up call, he said. I remember he writes, I think, that God does not give a person usually another chance. And I had another chance. Two little children. Who knows what would have happened due to my insanity. And it was his rock bottom. He straightened out his life from there going forward. Which is also quite something because I've heard people hit rock bottom and it doesn't always happen. Now, why am I sharing this? This just came to me because sometimes you want an example. It struck me. I turned his life around, wrote this book, became a very good writer. I think he died a year ago or two years ago, if I recall correctly. But regardless, nothing in the light would have woken this man up. He needed Jeremiah. He needed a prophet of doom. Not because he needed to hear negative, but because nothing would have shaken him. I must say that sometimes even the negative doesn't shake somebody. But there's something about it. And the question, the point here is not to demoralize us that you need to have a Jeremiah speaking to us, that voice within us, but it's to wake us up. So let's just go over the first few words of Jeremiah we read it last night, the Jewish tradition is the night of Tisha B'Av. Well, this year it was Saturday, Shabbos, so the Tisha B'Av, the fast day, is moved to Sunday. So last night, Saturday night, the custom is, and this has been going on for close to 2,000 years, 2,000 years, sitting with dimmed lights in the synagogues, sitting on low stools, like when you sit shiva, when you grieve and mourn for a, lost, for a loved one. And the book of Lamentations is read. Let's just read together the first verse. The first verse is woe, or alas, or how. She sits alone. She sits isolated. 
Jeremiah is describing the city of Jerusalem and talks about it like a personal friend. She sits alone. And he continues, this city that was filled with people, with many people, multitudes, is now sitting like a widow. Of all the things he chooses to begin with, is not the destruction, not the deaths, not the beginning of a long exile, not all the other consequences, the loneliness. The loneliness. You know why? Because when we don't feel alone, we can get through anything. If you look at any given situation where there's despair or hopelessness and darkness, the biggest challenge is not the very experience itself. If you knew someone was with you, it would give you some strength. It's because we feel isolated. We feel alone. We feel nobody wants to be with us. We, don't, we feel we don't want to have anyone there. No one will understand us. And you isolate yourself. That causes far more problems. Think of it this way. Two people are lying in a hospital bed. Same room or two different rooms, God forbid. One of them has guests and visitors and family and gifts and balloons and everything. The other one lies there alone. Nobody ever comes to visit. They may have the exact same problem, same illness, same infection, the same disease. But tell me what difference it will be. The first one has people around. It builds your immune system. Doctors acknowledge that today. It gives you a, a, a will to fight. It strengthens you. That's the fact. It's like people cheering you on. Just like fans in the stadium cheer people on. If someone's running a marathon, you hear people supporting you. It does something for us. When you feel alone, you give up. The situation becomes even more hopeless. Nobody cares. There's something that we have the power to comfort and strengthen each other. So actually, the loneliness is the key thing that really bothered him more than anything else. You know, it's one thing we have a tragedy. That's terrible. But it's the day after, when everybody goes back home and you go back to your bedroom alone, that's where it really hits you. So Jeremiah struck that. But what's the point of describing the negative? And why, why are we sitting and, and grieving over it thousands of years later? Because awareness is half the cure. If you want to know the people that really build resilience and the strength are not the people that go into denial and just ignore. No, you have to look at it, but you don't get overcome by it. And that was the key thing, and that is the, 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 the paradox. Yes, on one hand, you see the doom. On one hand, you see the loneliness. You see the darkness involved. But that is meant to motivate. It's meant to give you resources, an arsenal to deal with it. So now, let me figure out a way not to be lonely. Let me connect with someone. Let me find a mentor. Let me find a friend. I'm not sure who coined this, whether it was Eleanor Roosevelt or someone else. I think she said it about women, that you don't know how strong they are. That woman is like a tea bag. You don't know how strong she is until you put her into hot water. Well, it goes long back into history that when you really want to understand someone's strength, look what happens when they're in hot water. Number one is they won't deny it. They won't minimize it. On the other hand, they'll never be defined by it. And that's the key thing, because many people say, Move on. Don't look at it. Just go forward. Great, by all means. But if you don't look at it, and why is they saying that? Because you don't want to be defined by it. But looking at it doesn't mean you're defined by it. You can suffer. You can be in pain. and doesn't mean you become a sufferer. It means it can happen to you. And you learn to realize it's not me. I'm not defined by my pain. As much as I may have experienced it. And that's what Jeremiah, second half of the story is. That on one hand, yes, we look at it squarely, we take the, and we take the bull by the horns, and yes, it's a lonely situation. But what are we going to do about it? Because we forge ahead. So Jeremiah captures this, both these, this, uh, these voices that we need within ourselves. Now, obviously, if a person is going through something and they can just move forward and ignore it and take the, the high road, by all means. But very often that doesn't work. And that's why you often have to look at the darkness, but the way you look at it, you don't become frightened by it because you don't become defined by it. So there's the both parts to this, and that's what Jeremiah captured. Isaiah also spoke about the negative things, but his main focus was that this will lead to redemption. And that's also an important voice, and a vital and a critical one, because it's not just about 
not being afraid of the darkness and knowing that that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You also want to know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, a light within the tunnel. Or as the cynics say, not the light of an oncoming train, actual light. That's another concept. The mystics put it this way. There's the darkness that leads to light. But then there's also facing the darkness and realizing that you are not defined by it. And since you're not defined by it, you actually can control it instead of it controlling you. So the paradox is that you first have to recognize that it's there. To completely say it's not there. If Carr would have said, no, I've got no problem. Look, my children survived. And then he went and did it again. No, no. He needed to that scare. Now, no one should ever have to come to a point like that. Hopefully, we can be awakened and stimulated and aroused by something without having to see the worst possible scenario. By all means. But even when there is that darkness, we have to know we're not defined by it because you did not begin your life in a dark state. And Jeremiah teaches us this. When you read the story, you constantly see this, this, this subtle dance, so to speak. Maybe dance is not the right word, but the subtle pulsating elements of exhaling and inhaling, contracting and, ex- and expanding, the need to constantly balance these two extremes. And as those that understand that can learn how to navigate. We should all be blessed that our lives should be smooth, go only up, up, up. But it's like a wheel. There will be times we go up, there are times that we go down. That's how it is. As long as you keep moving, as long as you know that you can keep moving, as long as you know you're not defined by your experiences, you don't control your circumstances, but you're not defined by your circumstances, then you have that hope. So it's interesting, on one hand, the name Jeremiah, the name, very name, has the word in Hebrew, mar, bitterness, because he saw and tasted bitterness. At the same time, Yermio also means, Jeremiah means lifting and exalting the divine, the name of God. And Ram in Hebrew means to exalt, to lift. Yeshaya, Isaiah in Hebrew means the redemption. Yeshaya means Yeshua, redemption, salvation. Jeremiah, in the bitterness, we find the salvation, in the bitterness itself. So let me share a few words about that. In the Kabbalistic and mystical teachings, I'm actually teaching a class now, which I invite you to join every morning we have hold at 9.30 a.m. in New York time, Eastern Daylight Time. You can go to um, a website called chassidusapply.com and you can find more details about it. So we're studying something fascinating. So it talks about how you sweeten bitter waters. So there are three ways to do it. You can take bitter water, let's say something is bitter, and you mix sugar into it. You mix something sweet into it. The sweetness neutralizes or overrides the bitterness and you have now a sweet drink. The bitterness has not been transformed. It's been uh, essentially either neutralized or uh, nullified, been bypassed or outnumbered, if you wish. That's one way. The second is you bring such an intense level of sweetness that it actually, like, so to speak, zaps the bitterness right out of the bitterness. It's somewhat how perfumes are made. You, know, you extract the you could extract the toxins and you create this powerful aroma, but a beautiful perfume. So in a way, you've transformed it, but you have not transformed it necessarily from within. You brought a force, some type of other, uh, some other uh, 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 element or some other um, substance that, tr- that simply zapped it into submission, if you wish, and turned the bitter into sweet. But then there's the bitterness itself when you hit rock bottom and you come to a point of despair and you cry out, not because you see the light, not because of an epiphany, but something about the darkness itself that wakes you up so he explains that that comes from the deepest level of divine darkness, which is not actually darkness. It's higher than light. So there's a state that's higher than expression and deeper than expression. There's a state that's lower and beneath expression, and they have a certain connection. So, so fascinatingly, when you are in the state where you feel completely hopeless, there's something that lies there that comes from a place that is beyond any form of revelation. And that ultimately gives you the strength to transform it from within. Jeremiah was an epit- epitomized that type of experience. So there are people who have been blessed and their lives have been pretty much uh, an easy ride, so to speak. They lived in the light. But there are some of us that have gone through extremely difficult lives, gone through tragedies, setbacks, 
um, forms of different forms of loss and pain and suffering. And when you look at a person like that, that's gone through it and made it through, there's a certain level of, of refinement that you will never find in the light. It's a refinement that can only come from within. And that is ultimately, on a day like this, and with a prophet of Jer- like Jeremiah, of his stature, that teaches us these two elements. What it means in our personal lives is that we do have two voices. When things go difficult, many of us just start complaining, or we wish it didn't happen, and we try a way to avoid it. Others um, become, unfortunately, they become like some people tell me, I'm a child of darkness. I'm very accustomed when things don't work out because I grew up in a home where things never worked out and I'm always waiting for failure. I'm always waiting for the, no, the, the other shoe to drop. I'm always expecting disappointment. So that's someone who surrendered to darkness. The first person is avoiding it or ignoring it. And then there are those that say, no, it's dark, but you know what? That's not who I am. I've discovered something greater than darkness and light, a place that is beyond dark and light, beyond day and night. And that's the essential connection we have to who we are at our core, in our essence. And sadly, often we only get there through a setback, through a difficulty. When I say sadly, because I wish it was otherwise, other, it, was other, it was not that way. It was otherwise. In other words, that we should be able to reach it through light. But it's difficult to always imagine that being possible. So I want to wish everybody, every one of you, my dear friends, we should only have light in our lives. We should only have joy, celebration, good things. But when there is a moment of darkness, remember the black hole. The black hole in physics tells us that it's even more powerful than a white star, than light. It's so powerful it doesn't allow the gravitational pull of the star, doesn't allow the darkness, the light actually, the light to shine forth. So it's not lack of power, it's even more powerful. Now, if we could harness that, imagine what kind of energy that would create. Today we're told that the universe is made up of 80, 90% dark matter, dark energy, different names for it, different forms of it. So darkness is something that, uh, hello darkness, my old friend, darkness like the sound of silence has a power that is even louder than, uh, than sound, has a power that's more, has more energy because it takes more energy to withhold than to give. And we can access that in those darker moments. So we should be blessed with no darkness. Let's start with that. But should it come, know you can tap into it. And Jeremiah, the prophet of doom, but also of deliverance, teaches us that it's not about doom. It's recognizing that anything negative really has a deeper power within it. And even the very loneliness that pain can create when it's transformed can become the source of unbelievable connection and love. So loneliness is not an end in itself, but it can reach, lead you to great places, to places that allow us to become far greater than we would ever have been had we not gone through these darker moments. So may everybody be blessed, and may all the darkness be transformed into great light, and a light that's unprecedented, a light that is not created by light, but only through the negative. Again, we should all be blessed. It's always great talking to you about any topic. Sometimes we need to talk about these topics as well. And please, if you liked what you heard here, please share it and please subscribe. Now I've been told not just subscribe, also press that bell on YouTube for notifications. The same thing, liking things on, on Facebook and other platforms. And above all, I'd love to hear from you. Thoughts, comments, suggestions, questions, rebuttals, anything. Because at the end of the day, the antidote to loneliness is uh, synergy, is unity, is connection. And connection and attachment lies at the heart of all love and of everything that makes us into the healthiest, most wholesome people we can be. Be blessed and thank you so much. Simon Jacobson at MeaningfulLife.com is our website. Check it out for a full array of programming on every topic under the sun and above the sun. And uh, please enjoy and be well. Bye-bye.